body Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free What he did for me. Good morning, good morning, and all praises be to God, who is our Savior, our Redeemer, and the first place in our lives. This is a day the Lord has made. Wake up, wake up, wake up, and give God some glory. This is Pastor Duncan's at Shiloh Baptist Church, SBC Praise Church, and you've tuned in for a word from the Lord today. And there is a word. As you can tell, I'm excited about what God is doing. What God, anybody want to claim that with me? I'm excited about what God is doing, what God shall do, and most of all, I'm excited about what God has already done. Done. So join me in this powerful word. Don't forget, uh, if you're going to watching us virtually and you tuned in, please hit the notification button and make sure that you subscribe on YouTube and hit that like button and notification and make sure you get our messages every time we're on the air.
Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 20. Then came to him the mother of the sons of Zebedee, with her sons worshiping him and asking a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What good is that? She said unto him, Command that these my two sons sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I am about to drink? They said unto him, We are able. He said unto him, My cup indeed you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand it is not mine to give, but it is for them for whom it has been prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation concerning the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. Not so shall it be among you, but whosoever will become your great, great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever will be first among you shall be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Father God, please breathe again on the word that I've studied, Lord. Bring back to my memory. But more than that, God, have your way and preach your word. There is someone listening today that tuned in anticipating deliverance, anticipating that you would move in their life. And Lord, we believe and touch and agree with them that it's going to happen. Thank you, God, for another opportunity to partner with God, the Holy Spirit, and to preach your gospel. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We're going to speak for as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow. You can write this down. Improve your serve. Improve your life. Improve your serve. And you will improve your life. I'm going to make an opening statement that I believe most of you watching will agree with me. Or I have no doubt that no one can contradict that this statement is not true. There are some of you who really believe it's true and have applied it. There's others of you who believe it's true but have not used it. Then there's others of you who need to just get this in your heart and catch it. Listen to what I'm about to say. I believe, and here it is, God wants what's best for us. Doesn't sound like much, but it'll sure help you when things go down. When you're feeling low and pressures in your life, it will help you understand that no matter where you are, I dare you to repeat that this morning, God wants what's best for us. That is a powerful statement because what it's saying is God never ever wants us walking around defeated. He never ever wants us walking around mediocre with a so-so life, never able to handle the obstacles and the things that come against us. He never wants us so down that we do more complaining and more crying than we do celebrating and making sure God gets glory out of our life. He wants to make sure that we are not the kind of people that as soon as trouble comes, we don't realize who we are and who we are. I'm here to testify to somebody today. Snap out of it. God wants what's best for your life. Not only that, God wants you to have better. He wants you to be better. He wants things to happen better. He wants you to get better. He just wants better, better, better in your life. In the word of God, he tells us that he has given us or imparted to us some promises that tells us he wants the best for our life. All of you know John 10, 10, where it says the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, God, have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Don't get so caught up. In the familiarity of that scripture, they don't understand the words that God just said. He said, I came 
The purpose I came for was not just so you could have abundant life, but so that it could be more abundantly. He said, and that more abundantly. God wants you to go from one state of abundance to another. Watch me, somebody. Abundance is not things. Abundance is not stuff. Abundance, God wants the abundance of prosperity in your life. He wants you to walk abundantly, think abundantly, abundance for your family, abundance in everything you're going through. He said, I want to make sure you have what you need. And abundance is not just for when things are going right in your life. I'm going too fast for you. Are you with me? James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4. You know these scriptures, but you need to not run over them. Look at the magnificent promises or the landscape God has placed within this text. He said, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh, worketh, worketh patience, and let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Look at that text. It says God is working, even when you're not working. Hallelujah, somebody. God is working. Even when you can't see it working, God is working. Right now, I want to tell somebody, God is working in your life to make sure that things come to pass. Somebody ought to testify that God can and will work it out. All he's saying is that when you work and your faith takes you to a place of patience, and the word perfect in that text is the word mature. God is saying, the more you go through trials, the reason you can shout is because as you go through, you get mature, you get more mature, you grow up, you become grown. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. I remember going out on my own the first time that I got a bill that I didn't have money to pay. I'm in my apartment. Anybody ever been there when you got more bills than money? When you were first on your own and you got electric bills and cable bills and mortgage came in and, oh, God, don't mention a cutoff notice. I know some of y'all listening out there never been where I am. But a cutoff notice and you would freak out. And now, as you go through this, somebody testify, as you watch God bring you through. As you know, God is able to do what he said he's going to do. Is there anybody out there that can testify that I know it's tough, but when I first got it, because I wasn't patient, because I wasn't grown, I used to fret. Now a bill come in, they can threaten me, I lay it on the table, throw it on the counter, because I know I got a God who can supply my needs, so I grew up to the place that my God will bring me out of whatever I'm going through. But you got to understand, I'm talking about God wanting what's best for us. And finally, God wants best for us because God wants us to have all sufficiency. He wants in our life, I like this. I'm not trying to tap in on anybody's prosperity gospel. I'm not mad at the prosperity gospel people until they go off in some foreign doctrine that's not true. But it is true, basically, that God wants us to prosper. Not as the world talks about prosperity, but he wants us to prosper holistically. And if you look at this text in 2 Corinthians 9 and 8, it said, And God is able to make all things abound toward you. And you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have abundance for every good work. Do you hear what it said? God said, I want you to have what's sufficient. Somebody listening to me right now ought to, put, uh, ought to say a word uh, out loud to yourself of things that I need. Because if you're wondering why you don't have them, then you need to understand why God is able to get them for you. And not only is God able to get them for you, God said, I'll make you, so, I will give you all things so that you can have sufficiency. Sufficiency. You know what sufficiency is? Sufficiency is just not the thing. Sufficiency means I can lay my head on my pillow at night and go to sleep. Because whatever's lacking, my God is able. Somebody ought to shout right there. Whatever you don't have, celebrate it right now because God is able to bring this stuff to you. God is letting us know all these blessings he has sent our way. God told us I gave you abundant life. God told you you ought to count it all joy when you go through trouble. So abundant life is not just for when things are well, but when things are going wrong. Hallelujah. But also he said, now you also, because you're my child, I may it so your life will always be, you'll always have the things that you need for sufficiency. 
Somebody grab it right there. But we got a problem this morning. If God has given us all that, then why are there so many of us running around with lack? Running around unhappy? Running around without that abundant life God called us to? How come so many promises are missing? And I'm going to tell you, I know it's getting intense right up in here about now, but I'm going to tell you why some of those things do not come to pass. It's not because God hasn't given us to it, but he given them to us. But here is the problem. Let me explain it to you like this. The United States Navy sea, air, and land teams, they're called the Navy SEALs, is one of the most uh, coveted, positions in the Navy, one of the most uh, honorable positions, but it's also one of the most hardest to get into. They are undercover operators, and they go into the most dangerous areas, and they do the most dangerous missions, and everybody can't become a Navy SEAL. As a matter of fact, only 10% of the people who start out trying to be Navy SEALs make it. And here is why one captain who was also the trainer in the Navy SEALs tells about the people who make it and the people who don't. You want to hear this? He said, first of all, it's not the big muscle tough guys that make it. They look like they can handle it, but they can't make it out. They don't have what it takes. It's not the tattooed tough guys. They just look scary but they don't have what it takes. It's not even those college-educated, Harvard, Princeton, whatever you want to name, guys that come out looking like they can handle anything. They don't have what it takes to make it. Who are the ones that make it in this most coveted and toughest and grueling positions? Well, here it is. The people who make it are not the ones necessarily who look like they should make it. As a matter of fact, during their training, there's times when they look like they're about to give up, when they look like they're done, when it looks like they're filled with fear. But it seems that somehow, right when they get to the end of their room, right when it gets to the place where it looks like they shouldn't make it, right when it gets so grueling and punishing that it looks like they're about to throw in the towel, right when they have no more energy, you know what they do? They reach down and help another sis, another seal that's trying to make it. They reach down to the guy on the side of them and help them up. You must have missed something. You mean to tell me they're at the point where they just about making it. They're at the point where they don't know how they're going to do it. They got no more strength and they got a nerve to help somebody? Yes, because they tapped into They found out the reservoir of real power. They found out that what makes life worth it. They found somebody else. I may have just messed up your morning because you tuned in so you could hear me talk about how you're going to make it. But the secret for how you going to make it is you're going to have to learn how to serve other people. It is the key to power. And just like those Navy SEALs, so it is the key to power to us believers who are in Christ. It is the, it is the entirety of of God's interaction to us. Do you know that God's mind is occupied 99.9% .9 of the time with how he can help us? Have I got a witness? There's moments when I wasn't thinking about God, but the celebration is there's never a moment when God's not thinking about me. Hallelujah, somebody. Right when you were falling off the cliff, God reached down and picked you up. Right when the world said it's over, that's when God said, no, I still got something for you. Because God into a power that I've never seen before. That's the problem with most of us. Instead of us trying to act like God 
and serve other people. The reason we cry so much, the reason we're so hurt, the reason we look down at our future and don't see a future is because most of the time it's all about a stop for a minute, focus in on me. What I'm telling you is that Jesus said, God said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. From the foundation of the world, God said, giving is going to bring strength. How's your serve? Who have you helped lately? Who are you giving to? When have you given to God first and gave to other people second? When? No, no, I'm not talking about when the last time you asked for something. When is the last time you can honestly say you went out of your way when you were feeling miserable to help somebody else? I'm here to tell you that you're about to tap into one of the most explosive, dynamic ways to live and inquire and acquire the power of the Holy Ghost that's ever been. How do you know? How do I know? Look at our text. It's right here in this text. If you look at the verse, chapter 20, verse 26 and 27 says this, not so with you. Jesus was talking to his disciples. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And we're serving a slave. So if you want to be great, the word great does not mean great like somebody know you. It means being great with power. Being great in your walk in the Lord. He said, if you want to be great, whoever wants to be first, if you want to achieve everything God has for you, then you must be that slave. Just as the Son of Man, here's the key, did not come to serve, to come to be served, but to serve. Really, Jesus? Yes. You mean to tell me that's how you open blinded eyes? That's how you heal the lame? That's how you made uh, uh, crippled people walk? That's how you uh, fed 5,000 or more with two fish and five loaves of bread? Is that how you survived all the pressure the scribes and Pharisees were putting on you? Is that how you walk on water? Is that the power to do what no one else could do. And Jesus said, yes, my power is wrapped up in my service. He said, I never came, my purpose, I never came, the reason, I never came for people to serve me. But my first and foremost thought is to serve somebody else. Man, I'm telling you right now, if you want to change your life, improve your serve, improve your life. What am I talking about? Improve the way you serve folks. Improve your attitude about service. Improve the way you complain and talk about stuff. And find out how can I do more when you can do more. God always beats you doing more. You need to understand something. And I, and I like the fact that Jesus did all those miracles. But you know something I noticed when I was studying this text? Jesus was talked about. Lied on. Jesus found himself always uh, chased by the Pharisees and scribes. People didn't believe in him. And yet, this same Jesus always seemed to walk around with great mental health. Because if you look, there's a text that said he got up in the morning, prayed to his father, never stopped serving. He would say stuff like, my meat is to do the will of my father. Never stop serving. He wouldn't say my meat is to get some stuff for me because I really need some stuff. He said, no, it's so I can do what God wants me to do. Right before Jesus left this earth, John chapter 13, he was about to go away. He told his disciples, let's have a meal. When they got the meal together in the upper room, when he got up there with them, the Bible says supper being ended, Another part of that, the devil had placed in Judas Iscariot's heart to betray him, showing that Judas was a selfish person and not really a servant anyhow. But it said when supper has ended, watch this, Jesus got up, draped himself with a towel, washed his disciples' feet. When he got them washed in the disciples' feet, if you look at verse 12 and 13 of that text, it will tell you that Jesus got up, sat down, looked at his disciples and said, do you know what I've just done for you? And they said, yes. He said, that's what I want you to do for each other. I just washed your feet. I want you to wash each other's feet. And he said, remember, the servant is not greater than the master. And him that was sent 
is not is, is greater than him who is being sent who is sending. So what he was saying is that the servant, us, is not greater than the master, and the servant is not greater than his Lord. So he that was sent, meaning Jesus sent to us, is greater than he that sent him. Here's what God, here's what Jesus is saying. That I wash feet, which is the lowliest, dirtiest job. Stop. That's the problem. You never, ever thought you were the one that should do the menial job. Walking down the dusty streets of Palestine and Jerusalem in sandals. Whenever you sat down to a communal meal, your feet were showing because they sat low down at a table. They had to be washed. It was the job of the servant, the lowliest servant to wash feet. Jesus said, I did it so you can understand I'm leaving. I'm not leaving telling you how to, uh, you know, cast out demons, how to open blind eyes. I'm telling you how you do that first is become a servant. Many of us have missed the key to Jesus' power. And the last one is, you know this text, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 10, the great kenosis. Write that down. Kenosis just means the emptying. The Bible says in verse 5, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being made in the form of God, who thought it not robbery, let me, let me, let me read this thing right, who being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. Being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself into a servant. Please understand, it meant Jesus had power not to serve. He still had his divinity, but he decided to humble himself and serve God. And the Bible says because he did that, God gave him a name which is above every other name. He voluntarily decided to put aside his desire. I'm trying to make this plan. I know inside you there's something born inside you saying, but I've got to have this and, and I want my needs met and, and I know I'm a good person. No, you got to put your stuff aside. Help others first and watch what God does in your life. That word, let this mind, that phrase is in what we call the imperative tense or the imperative mood. Imperative means it is a command. He said, if you're going to be my servant, let this mind, let this attitude, let this thought be in you. That was also in me. And that is, if you want real power, you must learn how to serve. I'm telling somebody right now, you said, Pastor, I already serve. Yeah, well, serve more. And prove you serve. You can't beat God giving. All God is saying is, sometimes it's not what you do, it's the attitude you have while you're doing it. That's why he said, let this mind be in you. That everything I'm doing, I know I'm doing because I love God and God deserves it. From this text. Yeah, three points. I want to pull out this text and be able to get this so you can figure out. I'm talking to somebody here that God's getting ready to do a supernatural move in your life. He's getting ready to show you how to do something intentional that will bring about the results that you need. Jesus Christ is always an intentional God. When he gives us his word, he's telling us the things we can do, not guessing. He got rules in place for a reason. And he said, if this mind is in you, then you will become like me. That's why in this text it's so important that you see what happens when you are selfish and not a servant. Three things. Selfish, selfish requests destroy participation is our first point. Let's look at it. In this 20th chapter, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem in his journey. And on the way with his disciples, he's been healing He's been having debates with scribes and Pharisees. And he found himself in his 20th chapter still teaching the multitude and teaching his disciples. As a matter of fact, it opens up with a parable about the workers in the vineyard. And we look at the workers in the vineyard, it seems that some who had worked longer than others were upset because the ones who hadn't worked as long was getting the pay. Jesus wants us to know that the theme of this text is so many times you miss your blessing because you're worried about what other folk got. You're always looking around at what other folk got and what other folk have, and God said you're never really grateful or satisfied with what you have. Secondly, on his way, Jesus tells him again that the Son of Man 
He's going to be taken and killed, and in three days he should rise with power. They still didn't understand it all, but he kept telling them about his death. And then we start with this 20th verse of where we are right now, which is our text. And the first thing we see in this text, now watch this, our first point is selfish requests destroy participation. What are you talking about? Selfish requests. The me, 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 my, 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 I need this, give me, give me, give me attitude destroys your participation in a kingdom wall. You say, but you're not a product of the kingdom. You say, but you don't have access to power because everything about you is about you and the kingdom can't support that. Let's listen to it. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee. The scripture tells us that Salome, the mother of James and John, who Jesus had named the sons of thunder of Bojanaris. He named them that because of their character. This is so good. Their character, because Jesus named folk based on the fact that he knew their heart. Now we only find the fact, it's in Mark 13, 7, that he named them Bojanaris, or the sons of thunder. And in that passage, we don't get an explanation why, but we know in Mark 3.17, excuse me, we find out that it is because of something he has seen in their nature. Because Jesus knows us. Nobody has to tell Jesus what we're about. Nobody has to tell Jesus who you are. That's why it's such an exciting thing to be saved because Jesus knows, listen to me, every thought you ever thought, every thought you think, that's scary to me. That's a problem to me. Jesus knows everything I've done, everything I'm going to do. My God, I'm making myself scared here. Jesus knows. You guys have no idea some of the thoughts that can go through my mind and I imagine through your mind. And yet we got a nerve to cry, I'm saved. So what I say is instead of focusing on the trials you're going through, every now and then you ought to remember that my God knows all about me. And still, he wants me, saves me, and keeps me. And that's a blessing. As a matter of fact, I'm more joyful of the fact that God himself made sure that the plan of redemption was strong enough to include my stuff. Somebody say my stuff. I don't know about your stuff, but I got some stuff that I know is not holy. And God said, yet my blood can wash all that away. Hallelujah. So God is telling me that we need to understand he knows our nature. He named people. You know, Peter, he named uh, uh, the rock, right? We found out that he gave folk names because of their character. My, my, my question is, what, what would God name you if he had looked at your character? Uh, would he name us sons and daughters of meanness? How about Sons and daughters who can see everybody else's faults but can't see my own. Maybe that's our nature. We name you sons and daughters who believe that the rules of sanctification are not for them, that I can serve God any kind of way and God must still bless me. Or maybe your nature is, I come to God on my terms and I'm okay. Maybe God named you the sons of daughters, sons and daughters who think they're okay. All I'm saying is God's nature, our nature, this is a heart thing. This is about us understanding that faithful believers praise God because he knows our nature. But we find out that James and John's request was a selfish one. Look what happened. Their mother came with a request. Look what the text says. That she came with her sons to worship Jesus and make a request. It was a selfish request. See, they had heard Jesus say, again, he was reinforcing that he was going to die. And they said, well, what we need to do is get us some top positions in the kingdom. You know what I mean? Some of us are running around worried about our titles and where we are in the kingdom. So, so what they did, they snuck with their mama behind the rest of the disciples' back and said, let's ask Jesus for the best position in the kingdom because he said he's going to die. Now, they weren't worried about Jesus dying. They weren't all broke up crying about Jesus dying. They said, no, but man, we're going to get in there and get our stuff. Ain't that just like us? We made a selfish request. They came to Jesus and the request that they made 
was a selfish request. It was something for themselves. Now understand this. Selfish people in the Bible are people who know God's way, but they're so wrapped up in who they are, they really think that their wishes, their desires, and their needs are above the word of God. And I'm going to make sure, God, here's what I'm saying. I'm going to leave the role of holiness. I ain't going to be all that holy. I just got you and give my stuff. And that's the nature of most things. Why do you have two believers who are selfish? Samson. He was given the law, excuse me, he was given the charge not to cut his hair, not to touch dead things, not to drink any strong drink, the law of Nazareth. He was given the law to be set apart for Jesus Christ, the vow. And in that vow, God was going to give him power if he just followed what God said. But you know what he did? He started out, I want me a Philistine wife. I want that prostitute. I want Delilah. The very thing that you chase not to be a servant of God is normally or usually the thing that traps you. Wow. That's what kills self. His selfishness killed him. The prodigal son. His selfishness killed him. Father, give me my part of my money. He went off because without God and no protection, how many will admit we don't know when to stop? We don't know where to stop? We don't know how to control ourselves? But he went out, riding his living, drunkenness, spending money, sleeping around with everybody till his money was gone. And at the end of his journey, he found out, wow! Listen to me. Watch how God humbled him. I just want to go back to my father's house as a servant. Do you know, once you come full circle in this thing, you're just glad to have strength to serve. Let me give you an example. There was, just imagine this, if you don't take service as being something powerful. There was a woman who just gave birth. And after she gave birth, she had a stroke. First child. She was laying in the bed, couldn't talk, couldn't hold her child, couldn't serve her child, couldn't change a diaper. And she would lay in the bed and cry for hours because she lost her privilege to serve. I'm going somewhere. Or how about the man just got married, breadwinner for his house, promising marriage, and he had a car accident on the way home. Lost the use of both legs. Laying in the bed. Thinking about his job of service. You know, I'm the breadwinner. I'm supposed to take care of my wife. I'm supposed to take care of everything. Watching his wife go out and get an extra job. And he thought about, if I only have my legs. This is not right. I can't even serve in the role that God made me. I'm the husband. I'm the breadwinner. She shouldn't have to do that. But when he lost service, he realized the preciousness of service. When the woman found out, I can't even hold my own baby. I can't breastfeed my baby. I can't do anything that I'm supposed to do. I can provide no service. Some of y'all don't hear me. You think I'm trying to make you be a servant. I'm telling you when you're not a servant, you need to realize you're missing the power. And when you can't, Sitting in church won't give God glory. Walking around the day that you can celebrate and not celebrate. What happens if you lose the power to open your mouth and to wave your hand and praise God? You wish you could give God service. Look what happened. It says when the mother of Zebedee, the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and John came, says she worshipped him. No! See, many of us think what we do is worship. Because the Bible says she worshiped him and then she gave the request. See, here's what we think worship is. Maybe the church. Maybe I haven't worshiped God. Maybe I haven't thanked God. But when I get in there, man, I'm putting my request in. Mine, mine, mine. Lord, bless this. Heal that. Fix this. Do this. We think that's worship. That's not worship. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts of praise. Some of us come to church are holy. About what he deserves to have. Because the request 
she made, she thought was worship. Wow. This explains something. She thought that was worship. So Jesus looked at her and said, what can I do for you? Do you hear what I just said? How in the world do you get an opportunity where God says, what do you want? And the only thing you can think of is something for yourself. Out of everything you can name, anybody you can bless, you forgot the order God said. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind. Love thy neighbor as thyself. It's God, other self. But we put ourselves ahead of God and others, and we just come to church saying, I sure hope I get my blessing today. I need my breakthrough. And we forget that we're missing service. So she asked Jesus, she said, can you get my sons, one on the right hand, one on the left hand, and Jesus was caught off guard. Here's a selfish request. Here's, a, here's how you disqualify yourself from participation in the walk of God. You disqualify yourself from having any power. You, you doom yourself to walk in this walk without the things you need because you won't be a servant. How do I know? She said, can we be on the right hand, left hand? Can we have this position? Look at Jesus' response. He said, wow, you don't even know what you're asking. What she was saying Look, he said, uh, can you drink of this cup? The cup means suffering. Can you deal with life on the terms you just came to me? You think really, after it was me that saved you, you can go back to selfishness and you can make it without me. That's what you're telling me. Because they look at Jesus and said, we can do it. You really think you can drink of the cup? What Jesus said is, you're trying to tell me you want to come to me, but on your terms and my terms is you must come as a servant. But when you And you forgot the thing Jesus was talking about was the cup of suffering was reality in life. I, nobody will dispute me on this journey in life. We go through pain and pleasure and we go through problems and we go through pressures. I mean, we go through ups and downs. And the only way we made it through, can I get a witness, is in the midst of all of my dysfunctional times, God was right there with me. Anybody know God helped me through the crazies? God helped me through the moments I couldn't make it. God helped me through the days that looked like it was over. It was God. And yet I got a nerve to come to God and say, Lord, just give me what I want and I can make it. But they forgot something. Suffering. The basics of spiritual warfare. Do you realize what you told God is, Lord, I can handle the basics of spiritual warfare. Because we're going to have it. Our flesh, the world, something's going to happen. You don't believe me? Let me give you three basics of spiritual warfare that all of us have to deal with. And you're telling God, I don't want you there when this happens to me. The first thing you need to realize why you cannot come to God without the covering of servanthood is the fact that the devil said in Matthew 12, 43 to 45, he said, I will return. First thing you need to know. You walk around now all big because you defeated something. Or you conquered something. Or you overcame something. You only did it because God was with you. And you happen to be walking with God. And later, you got a nerve to tell me you're going to stray from God, but you still get out of that. No, what happens when the devil comes back? You're not ready. Matthew 12 tells us this. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, he walks the earth. Then he comes back looking at this vessel. If it is swept and clean, meaning that if it has now strayed away from God, it's not in worse trouble because he said I'm going to bring in I'm coming back to my house and I'm bringing seven more spirits here's what I'm telling you let me put this in a way it's not spooky to you you're going to be walking around how many notice something you overcame two years ago five years ago I need you to know you need Jesus every day because it's not just going to stay gone. The devil's number one modus operandi is he coming back. Now you wonder, how come I can't beat this again? I beat it last time. How come I can't get over it? God said, because now there's seven more spirits in you. Because you walked away from me. Basic spirit warfare. Second one is your mind. Can somebody say crazy? Can somebody say stress? Can somebody say anxiety? Can somebody say, I'm saved, I just shouted, I got the Holy Ghost, I've been walking with God, but there's some days I feel like I'm walking off. Can somebody understand what I'm saying? 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Here's what God is saying. The second thing you can't handle without me is the devil will build strongholds in your mind. These are the areas that you need spiritual power to get out of. That's why it says the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. Some people are hooked and wondering, why do I keep doing the same thing? Why can't I break this curse? Why can't I get it out? Because when the devil builds a stronghold, it's not humanly possible for you to make it without making sure you conform to the promises and word of God. We're walking around all bound up. I've seen Christians 15, 20 years in bound up crazy, committing suicide, sitting around whining over stuff they should have been and gotten over. But they went to the point that they didn't want to be a servant. And lastly, of course, the whole armor of God, holistic. He said, um, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil has so many tricks that you can't have. And yet they said, yes, I can. I can handle it. And Jesus said, no. Here's what he said. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, meaning that if I don't have God's armor, I can't stand. Maybe that's why somebody is not standing. Second point in this text, not only must you understand selfish requests stop you from participating in the power of God, access to the power of God, that it also tells you that a spiritual response will ensure your power. A spiritual response will ensure your power. Look what Jesus said next. Jesus said to them, indeed you will drink from the cup. Verse 23. But to sit on my right hand, left hand, I can't give you that. That's for someone who my father said should have it. Here's what he's saying. I prepared victory for those who are prepared for victory. God is no respecter of person. You're running around somehow, you built this stronghold, could be the devil, saying, well, how come my prayer is answered? Look like I'm the only one. It's because you made this thing so big, because you forgot that the, act, the activator of this, the activator this must be, I have to walk as Jesus did in a life of service, because this is a spiritual response, not a selfish response. The spiritual response says, I got to prepare myself. This is not natural. This is supernatural. It's going to take a supernatural power to get me so I can sleep at night. It's going to take a supernatural power to fix my relationship. It's going to take a supernatural power to heal my body. It's going to take a super, not a natural, but a super, some things in life take a supernatural response, and the only supernatural response is holding on to God. Natural versus supernatural. Just like the men in the vineyard. Think about it. Jesus said, the, the, the little parable says that the, the owner of the vineyard hired them in the morning and said, work for a penny. Then so he went out at 3 o'clock, went out at 6 o'clock, went out at 9 o'clock, even went out at 11 o'clock and hired more workers. And it was time to pay off versus instead of them being grateful that they signed on for a penny, when they found out the people that got hired at 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock was getting the same thing, they got upset. Because you know why? All they cared about was what they had. They were worried about what somebody else was getting. Instead of being grateful, instead of saying, there's some people out there who need charity, there's some people the owner want to take care of, they started complaining because in their heart, all they were concerned about is what were they going to get. That's the natural response. Don't miss it. Don't talk about them. The natural response to us is, our natural response is to tell folk off. That's why we can't stay certain. Our natural response is, ain't nobody running over me. That's why we can't stay certain. Our natural response is, you know what's happening? I'm mad at her. I ain't talking to him. Our, our natural response overrides our servant response. And when it does, we miss God's blessing. Somebody got to learn how to keep serving. But many of us who know that I serve God not because of the natural response, but when I think about where God has brought me from, I know I need to hold on and trust God, even when I don't see what he's doing. Can I get a witness? I believe that God has been so gracious to me that I got to be gracious to somebody else. I believe that God has done so much in my life, just want to serve things, that I got to hold on to God. Here is what I know. Even when I don't understand, I know what the song says that he knows what's best for me 
even when my weary eyes can't see. Watch this. I won't complain because God has been too good. Can somebody write that down? I won't complain because God has brought me too far. I'm hurting, but I won't complain. I'm struggling, but I won't complain. Because somewhere in this mix, my God's about to bring me out. And we got to understand, you got to keep Walking the lines of a servant. This is a spiritual response so you can tap into the power of God. In the NCAA race in 2015, I believe it was, in Riverside, California, 123 out of 128 runners missed a turn and went the wrong way. Everybody missed except one man named Mark Del Cabo. Here's what Mark did. He found out that folk were going this direction. So when he found the right turn, he would stop trying to lead people so they wouldn't go wrong. But everybody saw the crowd going that way, the crowd going that direction. So everybody went with the crowd except four people. Five people made it as winners and won the race. Mark won the race, and five of them came in right because they stayed on course. You better quit telling me your life is guided by what other folk do. You better quit following the crowd and be a servant like Jesus wants you to be a servant. The difference is i got to finish my course. you got to stay on the right track. I'm a runner for Christ. What did Paul say? I fought a good fight. I finished my course. Selfish response stops you from participating. Selfish request stops you from participating. A, self, a spiritual response gives you the power, gives you access to your power. And finally, spiritual resources lead to spiritual prosperity. Look what happened. The ten heard what these brothers were saying, and they said they were disgruntled. They were messed up. You want to know why we don't have corporate power? Want to know why there's no power in marriages? Want to know why there's no power in friendships? Because it says the first thing you lose, the resource you lose by not being a servant, the spiritual servanthood, the resource you use is unity. Nobody can touch and agree. Everybody's out for themselves. It's a big competition. I want my title. I want my stuff. I want everybody to respect me. I want my respect. We don't do, touching and agreeing, laying hands on each other, believing for each other's miracles. Oh, you will find you a saint that really looks at you and says, I wish the best for your family. They're going to be blessed because they blessed your family. So the first resource we lose is unity. Then Jesus called them together and he said, this shouldn't be like this with you. You're the Gentiles. Unsafe. They're the ones who be worried about Lord and over everybody you know, their authority and who they are. But if you want to be the greatest, you got to be a servant. If you want to be the one who is first or who understands, you got to be the slave. You got to be the one that's willing to bless somebody else. I'm going to close. I don't want you to hear this. This principle is all through Scripture. Spiritual Resources come from serving God, and you'll get your power. Watch this. Jesus said, no, if you serve, service gives you the power like I had. Service gets you out of that dump you're in right now. He said, matter of fact, there's nothing you can't serve your way out of. Look at the people who are great in the Bible, or first in the Bible. Those who we know serve God and love God. Think about David. When it came time to get a king, Jesse didn't even acknowledge that his son David, the running little boy, was in the field. No, he can't be king. He just out there serving the smelly sheep. But then he realized by serving God in the smelly sheep, he was the one eligible. He was the one given the power to kill the life. He was the one given the power to be the king. He served his way into his position. See, some of y'all trying to take a position, trick people for a position. You gotta serve your way in a higher position. You can serve your way out of anything. Daniel would not close his windows and pray. Because he said, I'm not gonna be ashamed of my God. They threw him in the lion's den. His service 
got him in the lion's den, but it was that same servant's heart that got him out of the lion's den. And finally, you can serve your way through anything. Help me, somebody. Somebody going through some stuff right now. Joseph was thrown in a pit, left for dead. God kept him. Sent to Potiphar's house, lied on him. God kept him. Sent to prison, God kept him. All I'm saying to you is, as he was going through all of that, he kept serving God. Did you catch that? Jesus said, the same thing I do, you can do. Because I've gone to my Father. But the Son of Man, as this text closed, did not come to be served. I came to be a servant. Some of you need to get a job in the pantry. You ought to get a job feeding other folk. You ought to learn how to serve somebody other than yourself. You ought to find yourself in a position you're not always asking people to wait on you. You ought to learn how to wait on people. You ought to learn how to be a giver. And if you do, you'll rise up. If you improve your serve, all the things you've been desiring will come to pass because Jesus Christ has said, I did not come to be served. And I have I came to serve. Improve you, sir. Not your whining, not your complaining. I, I'm already serving. Improve it. That's why this title is where it is. Some people say, I, that's on your terms. You want God to accept service on your terms. How about if God wants more? Improve you, sir, and you will improve your life. Can I finish with this? I know I'm out of time, but you ought to hear this. Uh, man and his son became these great art collectors. They loved collecting art together. He loved the fact that his son loved what he loved. Well, the war came on. His son was called over to war, and after not hearing from his son, he feared the worst because he was getting letters. And then all of a sudden, what he thought was happening happened. He got a letter saying his son had died. He was heartbroken. That was his best friend. They had pictures all over the house. Famous. They would just collect uh, famous masterpieces. Just had them everywhere. Uh, people all over the world knew about these masterpieces. But one day there was a knock at the door as the man was remembering his son at a Christmas time. And a young man came up and said, I'm one of the people your son saved. And I'm an artist. And your son said you like paintings. I don't do well, but I painted this picture. And the man broke down crying. It was a picture of his son. It wasn't the best, but it reminded him of his son. He hung it up. He said, now I can enjoy my art again because of my son. That picture meant the world to him. Well, time came and the man died. And there was to be an auction for all of these famous masterpieces. Collectors came from all over the world. Everybody came all the way around. And they said, man, I'm about to increase my catalog. I'm getting these pictures. And... The auctioneer started. Can you believe with this ugly picture of his son? How, how much can I get for that? A voice came from the back. Can we start the auction and get to the good stuff? The man said, this was my instructions. This is auction first. One man said, I got $10 just to get it out the way. And after a silence, one man said, I'll give you 100 100 going once. 100 going twice. 100 going three times. Finally, the man walked up, got his picture, and the auctioneer said, auction's over. They said, what? What are you talking about? Everybody started screaming, they were angry. What about all these masterpieces? He said, the instruction of the father was, the one who takes the son gets everything. While you're out there looking for other treasures, you got the son. And you have to follow him. Give him your all. And once you get the son, all the other blessings in the world will come your way. The one who follows the son, the one who stays on the course, the one who says, God, whatever you told me to do, I'm going to do because I am your servant. God bless you. This Pastor Duncan, I know it's a little long today, but this is some good stuff. Please. Share this with somebody. God bless you. And our offering, you'll see our offering information is on the screen. Please bless our ministry if you get an opportunity. The word you're hearing is the word we're sending out to help somebody else's life change. Help us by helping us serve and build the kingdom of God. God bless you. Have a good day. Talk to him and leave it there. I was down, but with no way up, and I needed some help. 
everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free 